Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an honor and a privilege to have you guys joining me here today on this glorious Sunday, 9 a.m., so we can get in a little bit of movie chat here before football starts. I know a lot of you aren't football fans. I'm a football fan. I can't wait to watch some football today. Go Pats. Uh, so anyway, guys, whole bunch of... A very interesting stuff to talk about here today. I'm going to let you know how today's show is going to run. Okay, I have picked out five topics that you guys have emailed in to me. How do you get a topic or a question on the John Campia Show? It's real simple. You just email me anytime at john at the johncampiashow.com. That's john at the johncampiashow.com. And make sure you put that word topic in the subject line. You have to have the word topic in the subject line. And guys, make sure to keep your emails to 90 words or less, or else I can't use it on the show because I wouldn't even be able to fit it on there. Now, after I go through those five emailed in topics, there's a whole ton of you watching this live. We do this show live every day, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. And on weekends, we do it around 9 a.m. If you guys are watching live right now, I'm going to save some time at the end of the show to take some live questions, comments, and opinions from you guys watching live right now. How are you going to get those on at the end of the show? It's simple. Wait till close to the end of the show when we get closer to the end of the email topics and then start tweeting me at John Campia. Just that simple. I will get through as many of those live tweets as I possibly can and maybe you will see your tweet at the bottom of this screen when we get to that. All right, guys, with all that out of the way, we got some Justice League to talk about. We got some movie star stuff to talk about. But let's get started with this. The first question today comes to us from Richard H. who writes... What are your thoughts on MoviePass's new $6.95 a month annual plan? And in your opinion, should current MoviePass holders quote-unquote upgrade? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. First thing to point out, that I believe the $6.95 is only for first-time uh, members. It's only for people who are signing up for the first time. I don't think you can take advantage of this if you're already a member, which is understandable. I get that. It's, it's, I totally get that. That's totally fair. So for those of you who may not know, and I know most of you do, but for those of you who don't know, MoviePass is a card you sign up for. You pay a monthly fee. I pay $10 a month, but they've got a special right now for $6.95. And you get that MoviePass card, and basically what happens is you can now go to the movie theater one day or one time a day and go to the ticket kiosk, buy your ticket, you use a mobile app to check in at the theater, pick the movie you want to see, then go to the kiosk, buy your ticket, and instead of using your bank card to purchase it, you use your movie pass card. You run it, and it pays for it. And you can see up to one movie a day for an entire month, excluding 3D, AMC Prime, premium theaters, things like that. But regular 2D screenings at most theaters, you can use this thing. At $6.95, first of all, at $10 a month, it is a hell of a deal. Because my local movie theater, which is the AMC Burbank 16, the average movie ticket price is $15. $15, that's for a regular 2D screening. I went to go see Justice League last night. Now, we went to the Prime Theater. That was $23.50 a ticket. Let me repeat. That was $23.50 per ticket. So me and Cody Miller, the Olympic swimmer, and his wife, Allie, the four of us went Almost had to drop a hundred bucks for four movie tickets. But anyway, for a regular movie ticket, it's 15 bucks. That means if I go to one movie a month with movie pass, I'm making money because I paid $10 a month for the movie pass card. And I just saw one movie that, that movie ticket was 15 bucks. I already saved five bucks. Amazing. Then if I go again and use it the next day, I've saved another 15. If I go to use it the next day, you've saved another 15. There are a few limitations. Again, you can't use it in the premium theaters. You can't buy tickets in advance, like you have, and you have to physically be at the movie theater to sign in on and check in on your app to then be able to buy the ticket. So you can't get online three days in advance and buy a ticket with movie. You can't do that. So there are some limitations, but at ten bucks a month, it's damn well worth it. At six ninety five a month, it's even more ridiculously worth it. It's it's a crazy good deal. Again, I don't think this company is going to be in business for another three years. I, I just don't. There's just This isn't a business model that can sustain itself. But for now, 
Why not? I, I recommend if you have not signed up for Movie Pass and you are a movie fan, sign up for Movie Pass. I think you're going to be happy. They have terrible customer service. The, sometimes their app just flat out doesn't work. But when you weigh all of that negative stuff against the positive of, hey, look, I'm seeing about 60 bucks worth of movies a month using my Movie Pass card for paying $10 a month. It's the math just works out. It's really good. Now, I should mention, I st also signed up for a Movie Pass competitor called Cinemia. And Cinemia, I told you guys a little bit about it a few weeks ago. Cinemia works basically the same in the sense that, you know, you get an app, you check in for, th for the movie on the app, and then you use your Cinemia card to buy the ticket. Here are some of the big differences, though, with Cinemia and MoviePass. Because I finally used Cinemia for the first time yesterday. I actually used my Cinemia card yesterday. Here are the big differences. It's more expensive. I just bought it for basically it's 30 bucks a month. And I bought it, I, I paid up front for it for a full year. So I paid 360 bucks for it, right? It's 30 bucks a month. But, and I can't go to one movie a day every day of the month. I can only go to the movies three times in a month. Three times. So 30 bucks a month, three times. But one of the big advantages of Cinemia is that I don't have to just buy one movie ticket. I get two movie tickets every time I go to the theater. So when I take and to the movies, I can buy two tickets with my card. For 30 bucks a month, that's pretty good. Now, on top of that, I can get into the premium theaters, the 3D, the AMC Prime, the, the premium theater type of stuff. I can get into those, which is great. So for 30 bucks a month, I can go to the movies three times and essentially get six tickets because I get two tickets every time I go, right? So I'm getting six tickets a month for 30 bucks. Last night, mine and Ann tickets to go see Justice League and the AMC Prime came out to almost 50 bucks. Boom, my Cinemia card has already paid for itself. Just like that. Oh, and the other big advantage of Cinemia is that you can use your card to buy tickets in advance online. Boom. So I can jump online. If I want to go see Justice League next Saturday, I can jump on the AMC website right now or Fandango or whatever and order my tickets now and use my Cinemia card to pay for it. Boom. That's something that the Movie Pass card does not have. Now, again, there's a trade off. It's a little bit more expensive. The Movie Pass card, you can go to the movie theater six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty 10, 20 times in a month if you really want to. They're both cards that have their individual strengths and weaknesses, but I'm really happy with the Movie Pass card with the deal that it has for the price it's at. And for 30 bucks a month that I ended up paying for the two ticket deal, they also have single ticket deals that's a little bit cheaper. But for me, that Cinemia card is already paying for itself as well. So I think that $6.95 deal on the Movie Pass card is definitely something film fans should look into. Uh, remember, it's not great customer service. It's going to have some hiccups. But overall, as long as you go to one movie a month, this thing is paying for itself. If you go to five movies for, in a month, you're saving tons of money. And then I would also suggest you guys check out Cinemia. It's uh, it's worth checking out because I'm, I've used it once now. Super happy with it. Very happy with it. So check those things out. And no, uh, this the John Campion Show is not sponsored by either Movie Pass or Cinemia. But if anybody from Movie Pass or Cinemia is watching and you'd like a, you'd like to sponsor somebody, John at the John Campion Show .com. Send on in your email. All right, enough of that. Let's get on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from. Gordon Hahn, who writes, I have been noticing that when an actor has won or been nominated for an Oscar award, in the marketing of a new film, they put Oscar winner or Oscar nominated about the actors. Uh, how come they do not do this with some actors, like, say, Tom Cruise, who has been nominated three times? That is a terrific question. So, yeah. So, like, for instance, take Murder on the Orient Express, right? In the trailers for Murder on the Orient Express, when they start putting up the names of the people, Academy Award winner this person, Academy Award winner this person, Academy Award nominated this, Academy Award nominated that, right? And they do that for a lot of different movies. However, Tom Cruise has been nominated, is, is a multi-time Academy Award nominated actor. Yet when Tom Cruise is in a movie, you don't see Academy Award nominee Tom Cruise. You don't see that. Johnny Depp has been nominated for an Academy Award. When Johnny Depp is in a movie, they don't put up Academy Award nominated actor Johnny Depp. You don't see that. So why is it that you see it in some places and you don't see it in other places? It's all about the marketing and what do you need. 
So for like something like a prestige feel film, like an Orient Express, right? They want to increase that prestige feel, that upper shelf kind of feel of the movie by putting in those Academy Award winner, Academy Award nominated, Academy Award winner. They want to put that in to increase the overall aesthetic of the marketing that this is a prestige piece. But for somebody like a Johnny Depp or this guy, Tom Cruise, their name supersedes the prestige of an Academy Award nomination when it comes to marketing a movie. When Tom Cruise is in your movie, all you got to do is put Tom Cruise. That's all you have to do. You don't need any other play on top of that. When Johnny Depp, and maybe things are changing for Johnny Depp now, but for the longest time, when Johnny Depp appears in your movie, you don't have to do anything else other than slap the name Johnny Depp on the movie. There are some Hollywood stars that are like that. And then there are some that are a little bit lower. When you end up getting a movie that has three or four or five Academy Award nominees or winners in it, then yeah, you want to highlight that point to increase the prestige of the marketing. So that's really much it. There's no rule involved with it. It's all about how does a particular studio want to market their particular movie? And do they think slapping in those Academy nominated, Academy Award winning tags on some actors, do they feel that will help and fit in with their marketing? Or do they think it's unnecessary? A lot of times in Tom Cruise's thing, look, you don't advertise the mummy, right? You don't market the mummy and have to put Academy Award nominated actor. But like that means nothing in a movie like the mummy. You don't need that. Forget the fact that it's Tom Cruise, like almost any actor. You don't have to put that in there because that's not really going to help your marketing for a movie like the mummy. People going to see the mummy don't really care if the people, the actors in it have won or have been nominated for Academy Awards, right? A, a movie like Murder on the Orient Express that does fit in to what the movie is and how they want to market it. That totally fits in, so they do it there. So that's why sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. Again, there's no rule about it. It's just however an individual studio decides they need and want to market their film. Thanks a lot for the question. It's a great question. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next one today comes to us from Jonathan Metal, who writes, Last night... I was talking to my dad about how Disney is making a new Star Wars trilogy and it will be with new characters. And my dad pretty much said he doesn't care because it won't be with the characters he grew up with. A lot of Star Wars fans only know the main characters in the movies. So if they were to make the movie based on, say, Knights of the Old Republic, do you think it wouldn't do great at the box office? Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. Look, generally speaking, I think there's some truth to saying things like, when you have a beloved franchise, if you make another installment of that franchise, but with characters and actors that nobody knew from the first one, is that going to hurt? I think generally speaking, the answer to that question is yes. Generally speaking, that's that, that'll hurt you. Yes. However, it's not a universal rule, and there are exceptions. As there are to most rules, there are certain exceptions. Star Wars, I believe, is one of those exceptions. Let's look at The Force Awakens. The vast lion's share of The Force Awakens marketing revolved around Rey, Finn, and Poe. It wasn't even until the second trailer that you finally saw Han. And he just comes in at the end and goes, Chewie, we're home. It's a great moment. It's a big moment. But the lion's share of that marketing was on other characters. Rogue One, yes, you did see glimpses of Vader in the trailers. Yes. But for the most part, you're dealing with, you know, brand new characters that had never been seen on the screen before. That movie made over a billion dollars. That movie joined the billion dollar club. The Force Awakens joined the most exclusive club there is, the two billion dollar club. I still believe there's only three movies in that club. Titanic, Avatar, and Star Wars The Force Awakens. So, Star Wars is a brand that, for the most part, supersedes that general rule about, yeah, you don't generally want to do another installment of a franchise with all totally new characters that people don't know and people don't recognize. That's true for the most part, but I believe Star Wars is one of those very rare brands that can exceed that general rule. Now, as far as Knights of the Old Republic goes, um, it would be a challenge. It's not a movie you can just automatically say, it's a Star Wars movie, it's going to make $2 billion. You can't do that. But... For it to expect it, just as a baseline, expect it to make $700 million? Yeah. $800 million? Yeah. As long as it's a good-looking movie and you put together good trailers and market it, people are going to go out to see it. 
And let's face it, not all the current Star Wars fans are began being Star Wars fans as a result of the original trilogy. Some of them, heaven knows why, got started with the prequel films. Some of them got started with The Force Awakens or Rogue One. So you have a Star Wars fan base today that is more diverse than it's ever been as far as that kind of stuff goes. So yes, if Star Wars wanted to make a Knights of the Old Republic movie, there was a very good chance it could do well if it's a well-put-together movie and they market it well. Don't expect $2 billion club or anything like that, but it's not outside of the realm of possibility that could become one of the next members of the billion dollar club. So anyway, that's just my thought on it. What do you guys think? Could a movie based around a property like Knights of the Old Republic, could that be successful? Yes or no? Leave me your thoughts in the comments section below and let me know what you think. All right, let's move on now to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Bob's Najer, who writes... I hope you can understand why I'm a bit disappointed Justice League isn't going to do great at the box office. I'm now worried Warner Brothers will shut down the DCEU because of lack of interest from the audience. My question is, what do you think is the reason more people went to see Thor, Batman vs. Superman, and most other comic book movies over Justice League? All right, thanks a lot for the question, man. And look, Obviously, this morning, for those of you who have not heard, I'm going to do a standalone video about this shortly after today's episode of the John Campion Show is done, so watch for that. But it's now come out that it is being reported that the early weekend estimate is that Justice League is indeed making under $100 million at the box office for its opening weekend, making it the lowest opening for any DCEU film. The reported estimate is $96 million. The actuals report that'll come out tomorrow, that could shift by two or three million dollars in either direction, but don't expect that number to shift by six million dollars. These Sunday estimates are usually really dead on close. It's very, 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 very rare that any Sunday estimate changes even remotely significantly when the actuals come out. They're usually bang on. So it could be as low as 94, 93, could be as high as 96, 97. But the bottom line here is Justice League didn't even make over $100 million. Suicide Squad made $135 million. Reps, let that sink in for a second. Suicide Squad made 135. Batman versus Superman made 166 opening weekend. Wonder Woman made 103. That's the trajectory, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. I'm going to talk about why this is, <clears throat> pardon me, why this is indeed, <clears throat> I had an almond before I started the show and now the freaking almond shell is stuck in my throat. Okay, I'm going to make a video later talking about why there is no way to spin this positively. There is no positive spin on this. Justice League is an unmitigated disaster, business-wise, for Warner Brothers. This is disastrous absolutely disastrous. Um, so I'm going to go more into that in my standalone video after the John Campy show is done. But to get to your question, why? Well, there's a couple of factors here. Factor number one, like we saw with the last Transformers movie, you can only put out movies that are divisive to the audience for so long before it comes back to bite you in the ass. And like we saw with Transformers, like Transformers putting out crap movie after crap movie, other than the first one, which I really loved the first one. But after that, it was crap movie after crap movie, but they still were making a billion dollars. Well, then the newest one came out. Guess what? You can only do it for so long. Eventually, the fact that the audience was divisive, regardless of how I feel about them, the fact that matters, you put out divisive film in Man of Steel, divisive film in Batman vs. Superman, divisive film in um, Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman seem to be pointing you in the right direction, but Batman versus or Justice League is not universally loved. And now it's starting to catch up to it. The other thing, I already mentioned this on the show the other day, I think they did, while some of the trailers were extremely cool, their overall marketing plan wasn't good. They didn't put the focus on the right characters. The decision to hide Superman, which was ridiculous, because everybody knew Superman was going to be in the movie, and yet you hide Superman in your marketing. Um, on top of that, I think some of the Ben, like the Ben Affleck coming or going stuff probably undermined it a little bit. You're talking about some of the, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different factors that ultimately led up to not nearly as many people going out to see the movie on opening weekend, like they have with previous movies. Who would have thought at the beginning of this year, 
Thor Ragnarok is going to make more money opening weekend than Justice League. Who would have thought that? Not me. Not me. Look, I, I don't have, I don't enjoy pointing out my predictions that go wrong, but I predicted one, that Justice League would make 135 million opening weekend. <laughs> wrong. I predicted two, Justice League would be only the second DCU movie to get a 70% rating on Rotten Tomato or higher. <laughs> wrong. I predicted Justice League would be the first DCEU film to join the Billion Dollar Club. <laughs> wrong. So I've, I've struck out. I'm three strikes and I'm out on all my Justice League predictions. Other than the fact that I enjoyed it. I, I predicted I would enjoy it and I have. I, I've seen it four times already. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of various... There's no one big giant thing that has added up to the disaster that Justice League is at the box office. It is it's literally... It is a bunch of smaller things. The divisiveness of past films... Um, the, the botched marketing plan, the, the, uh, external outside of the studio drama going on is Ben Affleck coming or going, is this happening? Is that happening? Blah, blah, blah. All these types of things that just eventually start to sour people on the movie. And then they just don't go see it. You know, it's funny. I had this debate with somebody on Twitter the other day, and I've been seeing a lot of people repeating this online. Marvel is for the critics. DC is for fans. Critics may love Marvel, but fans, they love DC. And I remember saying to this person, then why aren't the fans going to see it? <laughs> if Marvel is about the critics, and, all, and the critics love Marvel, but the fans, they love DC, why are the fans not showing up? Why are the fans not going? This is Justice League, for heaven's sakes. This is DC's Avengers, for heaven's sakes. Where are they? Why aren't the people showing up? And I liked it. I did my part, folks. I, I mean, I went to go see it four times. Granted, twice were press screenings, but two other times I paid to go see those films. I did my part. Um, and it's just, it's really, so the answer is, I think it's a lot of different things that add up. All right, let's move on now to the final topic of the day. And then I'm going to do a short commercial break. And then I'm going to go to you guys and your live questions. Start getting your tweets ready to send in to me. And the final question today comes to us from Natalie Miller. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Natalie Miller, who writes, Hi, John. Watch your show almost every day. My question is regarding the massive difference between Justice League's critic and audience ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. Last I checked... It was at 39% for critics and 86% for audience. Clearly, fans are loving it, but not critics. Why are the critics so out of touch with the fans on this movie? Well, thanks a lot for the question, Natalie. And yeah, let's talk about this. These numbers, which you see right here, have been the topic of a lot of discussion online over the last couple of days in the movie fan circles about, wait a minute, why is there such a huge disparity between that critic number and that audience rating number why is that number so huge why is there such a huge gap why are the uh, why are the critics so out of touch with the audience well the reality is they're not let me explain the the reason you shouldn't really rely much on say imdb's audience ratings or even rotten tomatoes audience rating is that people are able to vote on a movie even if they haven't seen the movie. It doesn't matter. You go over to IMDb, for example, and you look at the breakdown of what percentage of people gave it a 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, right? Like almost 40%, if I'm remembering right, like somewhere between 30 and 40% of the people gave it a 10 out of 10. Come on, is anybody going to tell me Justice League is a 10 out of 10 movie? I'm sure there are a few people who subject subjectively for them it is, and that's fine. But you really think 30 to 40% of the people out there think Justice League is a 10 out of 10 movie? Even the people I know who love Justice League the most will tell you it is not a 10 out of 10 movie. But more importantly than that, there was roughly, I think they said like, however many tens of thousands of votes before the movie even opened. That means tens of thousands of people were voting 10, 10, 10 before they ever saw the movie. Same happens on Rotten Tomatoes. Rotten Tomatoes, not with the critic scores, but rather with the audience scores. Audiences are able to just jump in whether they've seen the movie or not. It's like, I'm just somebody who wants DC to do great. So I'm going to go in there. I'm going to click 10. I'm going to give it an A. I'm going to give it its high 100%. It doesn't matter if they've seen the movie or not. Then they log out, log back into somebody else. with Because like, a lot of people have multiple online 
uh, IDs. That, that's normal today. So then they log out, log back in, vote 100% again, whether they saw the movie even before the movie ever opened. To me, this is basically not, this isn't even up for debate. The most accurate way, and no system is perfect, the most accurate way to really know what the audience score is, is not IMDb, and it's not even Rotten Tomatoes, because they both have the same flaw when it comes to their audience ratings. The most accurate way to really tell what the audience rating truly is, is cinema score. Because cinema score actually goes to the movie theaters and they actually reference people and talk to people who actually come out of the movie. They talk to people that are verified viewers of the film that actually just saw the movie. It's the only IMDb doesn't do that. Rotten Tomatoes doesn't do that. Nobody else really does that. Cinema score does that. So cinema score gives you the most accurate, it's not perfect, but it by far gives you the most accurate idea about what an audience score really is. Okay, if we're going to say that, let's take out that 86% number. And let's say that the critic rating is 39%. The cinema score right now for Justice League is a B plus. All right, now follow me here. You might be saying, understandably, if you think in school terms, hey, B plus is pretty damn good. B plus is great. So audiences love Batman or love Justice League, right? No, because cinema scores don't work the same way school card scores do. All right. A B plus is actually not that great of a rating. Let's do some comparison here. Okay. These are all films that have come out this year. Let's take a look at this list. Follow me now. Here we go. Justice League with a B plus. You know what else has got a B plus? Same critic rating, same audience rating, I should say. Look down at the bottom. 50 Shades Darker. One of the most gigantic pieces of garbage ever to be released in cinema has a B plus. That should give you an idea about what a B plus means. What else has a B plus on this? Baywatch has a B plus. Fifty Shades Darker has a B plus. American Assassin, which I liked, but was pretty divisive amongst fans. American Assassin has a B plus. What are some movies that have better audience ratings than Justice League does? Power Rangers. Power Rangers. Now look, I liked Power Rangers, but the audience scores Power Rangers, according to some score, the Power Rangers has a better audience rating than the most accurate way. Power Rangers has a better audience rating than Justice League does. What else has a better audience rating? Daddy's Home 2. Dad, My Little Pony has an A- minus cinema score. Better audience rating than Justice League. Thor Ragnarok obviously has an A. The only movie on this list, that on this particular list, that Justice League has a better audience rating than is the Emoji Movie. Congratulations. You got a better audience rating score than the Emoji Movie. I mean, so let's just take a look at this again. So movies like the new faith-based animated film, The Star has an A, Dice on Milo put Despicable Me 3, which I thought was a rotten movie, has an A-, minus. Thor Ragnarok, uh, Fifty Shades Darker, Baywatch, uh, King Arthur, which I like King Arthur, but a lot of people, a lot of you guys seem to hate it. Um, but uh, King Arthur has a, has a B+, plus, same as Justice League. So really, if you want to take away the really flawed systems that allow people who have who, to vote multiple times, who haven't even seen the movie, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, that's IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes. Take that out of the equation for now. They're still fine to reference if you want to reference them. That's fine. The real accurate one, though, is CinemaScore because they verify they're actually talking to people who actually saw the movie and getting their real scores. And when you do that, suddenly what you think is a fantastic audience rating you start to realize, oh, it's actually not that great. It's not horrible, horrible garbage, but it's not all that great. So you can make yourself feel better and I can make myself feel better by going, oh, and just look at the Rotten Tomatoes uh, audience rating and go, oh, well, audiences love it. Some of us do. I do. But no, it is completely false to say that Critics hate it, and hey, look, almost four out of every ten critics like the movie. So it's a misnomer to say critics hate it, but fans love it. Sorry, um, this tells you otherwise. This this tells you otherwise. 
And that's unfortunate and whatever, but it just goes again, film subjective. Just because I love it doesn't mean other people are going to love it. Just because you like it doesn't mean other people are going to like it. I mean, we all acknowledge the flaws about Justice League, but we got to understand then those flaws that we acknowledge are there, those are going to be more important to some other people than they are to us. Maybe to me, the bad CGI doesn't bother me so much. Maybe to me, some of the bad di dialogue doesn't bother me so much. But to somebody else, it's totally reasonable that it would bother them a lot more than it bothered me. So, I mean, that's it. The reality is there isn't that big of a disparity when you look at legitimate audience ratings. There's not that big of a difference between the critic scores and the audience reaction. It's, I know that's not what we want to hear. I know that's not the popular thing to say. I know that's not what we as movie fans want to grasp. It's easier for us to go, oh, the critics just hate it, but the audience loved it. it it's, that's a much better world for us to live in, right? But the reality is that's not the case. We may love it, but there are a lot of people who legit don't. And that's okay for us. That's okay as movie fans for us to acknowledge that and admit that. But it's, um, yeah, these numbers here are a little bit deceptive. The top one's not deceptive. That's real critics actually giving the ratings. This number down here, that one's a little bit deceptive. You got to go over to something like Cinema Score and understand how that's their score compares to the other movie scores. And when you see that Justice League has the same audience rating as Fifty Shades Darker, Baywatch, King Arthur, and less, <laughs> less than Daddy's Home 2 and My Little Pony and Power Rangers, you start to get the picture that, oh, the audience reviews, the audience rating really isn't that good. And, um, and that's, look, that's not what I want to say. That's not the way I want it to be, but I mean, that's, that's what it is. That's simply what it is. All right, guys. Now I'm sure you guys have a lot to say about a lot of this kind of stuff. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my daily little commercial break here for the next 60 seconds. That's going to be me talking about my Patreon supporters and how Patreon is the thing that actually even makes these shows and these videos possible. I'll be back in one minute and we'll start going to the live Twitter questions. Check this out. For those of you who have followed me for any period of time, you guys know that I made the decision recently to leave the corporate overlords. I no longer wanted to work for corporations. I wanted to be an independent content creator. And the only way I've been able to do that is by the support of my Patreon supporters. So what I would like to do is to ask you guys who watch my shows, who spend any amount of time with me every single month, to consider going over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. There you'll get all the information about what exactly does it mean to be a Patreon supporter of mine? What does being a Patreon supporter do for helping to make sure that shows like this one and all the other shows I do here on my channel can actually be produced? And on top of that, what benefits are there to being a Patreon supporter? And maybe if you guys can check that out, if you decide you want to be one of my Patreon supporters, that would be awesome. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just happy that you guys have decided to be here today and be a fellow movie fan and join us in the conversation. So go and check out the website, see if you want to become a Patreon supporter. And now let's get back. All right, guys, thank you again. And a special thank you to all of you guys who are my Patreon supporters already. You guys make this show possible. Thanks so much. All right, with all that out of the way, I'm going to open up my Twitter stream right now, and we're going to get going on some of your guys' live questions and get going on this. Here we go. The first question comes to us from John is Nerf Fab. Okay, there we go. And John, top five or three most powerful force users in your opinion? Uh, Luke Yoda Emperor. That's, um, oh, sorry. Luke Vader Emperor. I'm going to go, I'm going to go that way. Luke Vader Emperor. And probably in that order is the way I'll do it. Okay, let's try this one. Matt Light 19 writes, John, my theater was full on my second viewing last night for Justice League and everyone in the theater gave it applause at the end. That's great. Um, I was also in one of my four screenings where everybody was laughing and hooping and hollering and having a great time. The theater I was in last night, not so much. It was a full theater last night. I went to the AMC Prime at the AMC Burbank 16. Full theater. And there was a small group of three or four friends near the front that were doing some clapping at scenes, but uh, it, it wasn't the same. Again, I was in another screening where everybody seemed to be having a great time. And then the screening I was in last night, not so much. Here's the thing. We got to be careful not to make grand assumptions on our small sample sizes. For instance, if I if the only time I went to go see Justice League was last night and I was in my one little tiny sample size, one theater at in in one city in somewhere in America, one showing. And I say, "Well, the audience uh 
wasn't all that didn't react all that much. That means everybody doesn't like Justice League that much. No, it just means that one small part of the overall experience didn't react. If you just take your sample size, the theater I was in was full and everybody had a great time. That's great. But that doesn't mean your tiny sample size is actually an accurate reflection of the overall picture. So what we as film fans got to be careful of, you know, this happens a lot of time when I get in discussions about Batman Beyond with some people. I tell people, nobody wants to, sorry, the general movie going on doesn't care about Batman Beyond. They just don't. But somebody say, John, everybody I know loves Batman Beyond. Okay, great, but you are a tiny, tiny segment and a tiny sample size of the overall picture. And that's not an accurate picture of the entire picture. So, and right now there's still more people shaking their fists at the screen at me. How dare you talk about Batman Beyond like that? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not dissing on Batman Beyond. I'm just saying that the general movie going on is, isn't interested in it. That, I'm not saying it's not great. I'm not saying that the short-lived TV show wasn't wonderful. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, which I think you will agree with if you calm down and, and think about it for a second. If you go to a movie theater right now and interview 400 people coming out and say, do you know who Batman Beyond is? They're going to say, no. Do you know who Terry is in Batman? No. And none of them will care. Bruce Wayne is Batman. That's, that's what they care about. But... Anyway, that's a whole nother discussion for another time. That's just my thoughts. I'm sure many of you have some opposing views, and that's great. We're, we're about having opposing views. We're about having different opinions. That's the great thing here. Okay, let's see. Next question comes to us from JRICardo05H. I don't know what that's supposed to say, but John, even with Justice League now low opening weekend, do you think Warner Brothers um, is still pleased with the movie and will make another one? No, I don't. I think we are maybe a month away, maybe six weeks away from hearing some major announcements from Warner Brothers about a whole new direction for their DC properties. And I don't know what exactly they're going to do. Look, Aqu some people were saying, I noticed some people saying in chats earlier today, well, they're going to cancel Aquaman. Well, no, Aquaman's already shot. I mean, they still have some reshoots to do, but generally speaking, the principal photography on Aquaman's already done. I mean, they've spent the money on it. Um, they're not pulling the plug on Aquaman. Now watch tomorrow. They announce they're pulling Aquaman, but no, I'm, I'm very confident. They're not going to pull Aquaman. Um, and then what do you do with Wonder Woman? The Wonder Woman was one big successful movie you had. I mean, so you can't pull the plug on that. I don't know what they're going to do. They have some big things to figure out, but all I know is this, the concept that DC's Avengers, the justice league makes under a hundred million and is the lowest opening weekend out of all your films in the cinematic universe? That costs people jobs. That gets people fired. That, that is a total change of direction that needs to happen. And at this point, the foundation is now just a wreck. Because now you've got four out of your five existing films are at best divisive. And now you just want to try to... You can't... Look, if you're building a house and your foundation sucks... It doesn't matter how pretty is the house that you build on that bad foundation. Eventually, that house is going to crumble because the foundation can't hold it. At some point, you just need to look in the mirror and go, what we tried was worth trying. We did our best and it didn't work. It's time to scrap it and start again. At some point, you need to do that. Look, Sony did that with Spider-Man a couple of times and it worked out great each time. It worked out. Um, so they did it with Hulk and it worked out. They, you know, they will do it again. And when it'll happen, how it'll happen, what will be the details of it happen, which movies will survive, which movies will get canceled, I don't know yet. But I do believe we're probably about six weeks away from hearing some major announcements. And it's going to be a change of directions. Do I believe we're just going to flat out get a Justice League 2, the sequel to this movie? Nope, I don't think it's happening. Not with under a $100 million opening weekend. Uh-uh, no way. No way uh, is that happening. And I could be wrong. I would love to be wrong about this because I look, if I'm wrong about this, you throw the party, I'll come and bring the beer. But because I want to see another movie with this cast of characters, of these people playing it, but the reality is reality. It would be a bad business move to do it. I think they need to just kind of scrap it and start again. Uh, let's see. The Geeky Taco is asking a question I've answered about nine times in the past week or two. John, should we fans expect an extended cut of Justice League for home release? No, I don't think so. For a couple of reasons. One, Warner Brothers got a lot of backlash from fans like when Suicide Squad came out with an extended edition. And a lot of fans complained. Are you going to do this every time? Are you telling me I paid 15 bucks to go to the movies to watch this movie and you didn't show me the whole movie? And now I have to pay for it twice to actually see the full movie? That pissed a lot of fans off. 
So Wonder Woman comes out on Blu-ray, no extended cut. Warner Brothers is basically in good faith to their fans seeing the movie we gave you in the theater that you paid to come see is the full movie. So I believe the Justice League Blu-ray DVD, and I could be wrong about this, maybe there'll be an extended cut, totally, there could be. But the way I think they're going to do it is that there will be a lot of deleted scenes, there'll be a lot of special features and all that kind of stuff, but as far as an actual extended cut, I don't think so. Could be wrong, but if you're asking me to put money on it, I would put five bucks that it's not. Okay, let's go to the next one. And the next one comes to us from Austin Maine, who writes, John, I love Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman, Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman, and Justice League. I don't care what anybody thinks. No, exactly. I mean, look, I care what people think because I'm interested in other people's opinions. I like knowing what other people think. I do. But what they think doesn't change what I think. I think there's a fine line. There's, there's a misconception out there that if in order for me to be secure in my opinions means I shouldn't listen to anybody else's opinions. Nah, 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 nah. No, that's not it. Like I'm secure enough in my opinions that I enjoy hearing what other people think. And you know what? Maybe sometimes what they think, if they raise good valid points that make me think, go, hey, you know what? That does change the way I think a little bit. If they raise good valid points, that's about being open-minded. That's about growth. That's about not being stagnant or stubborn. But I totally love hearing, I care about other people's opinions because it lets me know and it gives me some insight into a different perspective that other people have than I do. But it doesn't mean I need to change what I think. Look, man, you may love the prequels. Just because I don't like them doesn't mean you shouldn't like them. Everybody loves the original Blade Runner. I don't. That's okay. I love hearing why people love Blade Runner and it can help me understand why they love Blade Runner, but it doesn't mean I have to change my opinion. So uh, just try to stay a little bit open-minded about it. All right, let's see this. Next one. Uh, Ari Grande Poops writes, John, favorite scenes from The Incredibles. Dash running on water still gives me goosebumps. You know what to me it is? I think it was that one scene. It was close. I think still in the first act of the movie where Mr. Incredible is sitting alone in his study and looking back at the glory days. And you know, one of the brilliant things, this is, Incredibles was really the movie for me that made me realize, you know what? Pixar movies are not kid movies. They're not. They're kid-friendly movies. And there's a big difference. Because I guarantee you, most kids, the real deeper meanings and a lot of the point of The Incredibles went over most kids' heads because there's no way they'd be able to understand it. That movie, if you're really saying who was The Incredibles for, it was really for parents, middle-aged parents. That's who that movie was for when you really sit down and watch that film. And I think one of the most beautiful scenes is that scene near the beginning of Mr. Incredible sitting there looking back at his life, looking where he is now, starting to question decisions he's made, directions he's taken, missing the old days, and then eventually learning what he has actually now is the greatest thing in the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the many, many reasons Incredibles is one of the greatest animated movies ever made. It's just gorgeous and beautiful. Anyway, that's one of the things that really stand out to me about that movie. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, let's see. Um... Frazzohoff writes, uh, John, now that Justice League is out, how would you rank the DCU films now? I've said this the last couple days in a row. The DCEU movies, to me, are um, Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman, Wonder Woman, Justice League, Suicide Squad. So I would go, oh, you know what? Hmm. Let me think about that. I mean, Man of Steel is still my number one DCEU film. Um, I like Bat Batman vs. Superman. I have to give it some thought. I have to give... Definitely my number one is Man of Steel. Definitely my number five is Suicide Squad. Um, Wonder Woman is above Justice League for me. Although I, I like Justice League a lot. Obviously, seen it four times. Um, but I have to think about that to really make up a definitive list. Good question. Let's see. This next one comes to us from I am Xander Uden, who writes, John, if this movie was finished by Zack Snyder, how different would the movie be? For me, a lot, uh, a lot, but better. Don't, don't bet on it. Don't bet on it. Um, look, from the people I talk to, and I was told this a long time ago. Remember those early reports that came out that said there was an early screening of Justice League and the quote that went around was, it's an unwatchable mess. Remember that? That wasn't quite true from the people I've spoken to. That wasn't quite true. What is true, though, is that there was a lot of concern about it. I think it got twisted and exaggerated into unwatchable mess is what got put out there. And from what I understand, that's not quite true. 
but what it, but the general feeling that there was a lot of concern about it. Um, from everybody that I know, and, and it's, a, it's a small number, I don't want to make it sound like it's dozens of people, it's not. It's, there's a couple of people I know that say, look, if if they saw, like the, the movie that ended up being the amalgamation of Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon ended up being a much better movie than just the Zack Snyder movie was turning out to be. And that's why they changed it. And that's why they spent all the money. And that's why when you even hear critics of the film of Justice League, why they say, but you know what? It... it it's a, it feels though like it's heading in the right direction. It's it's because of the they changed it. Um, I don't want to go much more into that. I mean, really, you guys know this already, so there's really not much more to add. But that's the general kind of feeling of it. All right, I got time for a couple more. Um, let's see. This one comes to us from Connor Furlong, who writes, John, because fans, of course, are biased. I mean, that's true. Fans are biased. Look, one of the big things about IMDb scores, Rotten Tomato scores, and even Cinema scores. Like I said, cinema scores is by far, like it's no, it's not no question. The most accurate audience rating system is cinema score, but it's not perfect. All right. This is why a My Little Pony gets an A minus. This is why a, uh, what was that? A, a Fifty Shades Darker gets a B plus, just like Justice League and Justice League gets a B plus is because who are most likely to rush out and see a movie on its opening weekend? Who are the most likely candidates to go out and do that? DC fans. My Little Pony fans. Fifty Shades of Grey fans. They're the ones who are most likely to run out and see it and got to see it opening weekend. Big comic book fans, you know, whatever. These are audiences and people who are probably more naturally inclined to like it regardless. So that's why even though it's low compared to all the other movies on cinema score it still gets what's called a b plus so you got to be very careful with audience ratings things like that and the, the critics you get some critics that are predisposed comic book fans some critics that are predisposed to not liking comic book movies and just want to go in and see a movie and that's why you get a probably more accurate reflection whereas you know you don't get people who aren't dc fans rushing out opening weekend to watch justice league or to watch my little pony or to watch 50 shades darker or to watch whatever or the emoji movie or whatever um, but it is, yeah, you're right. Fans are biased. Fans are biased. I mean, not across the board, but generally speaking, we have our biases. Uh, let's see. Let's try this next one. This next one comes from Milky7382 writes, John, do you think that Warner Brothers will start focusing on their DC movies that are not connected to the DCU, like the upcoming Joker movie? Yes. I think that will probably be a part of their strategy for their rebuilding stage. And you can't blame them. Now I could be wrong about that. Like they might wipe the whole slate clean. They might defy reason and actually do justice league too. I mean, we just, we don't know what they're doing at this point. We're just speculating, but I think what you're saying sounds like the most reasonable thing. I do think they'll probably start using some of these projects, a couple of select ones and really make them as standalone films and see where they go from there. Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from the media table writes, John, I love the DC films directed by Zack Snyder, but the Justice League film was not Mr. Snyder's fault. Uh, it is not entirely Zack Snyder's fault. It is not entirely Zack Snyder's fault. It is not entirely Joss Whedon's fault. It is not entirely this person's fault. It's not entirely that per person's fault, but they all share a part of the blame. And like I said, from everything that I'm being told, the movie as it was, was not going to be as good as the movie that actually ended up coming out. That's the general consensus. Um, so you can believe that or not believe that if you choose, that's fine. I am just telling you what I've been told. You take that information and you do with it what you will. Nothing wrong with that. I'm simply telling you the information I've been told. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, let's go to this next one. And we'll just take a couple more here really quick. This next one comes to us from Devontae Brown 17 who writes, John, what happens to Shazam? Does that get canceled since it's in its casting stage? It might. It might. Um, or they could also retool it a bit to truly make it a standalone film. That Shazam is the one superhero in the world. Maybe they rejigger it a little bit to make it fall in line with being a standalone type of movie. Or maybe they just move ahead as planned. Those are the three possibilities. And I think they're all equally valid possibilities. They just move forward with it as it is. They move forward with it, but they retool it to be a true standalone film or they just scrap it. I mean, these are all possibilities. We'll have to see what they do. 
Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from John Smee, 2080, 7211, writes, John, I'm starting to believe that Justice League is not going to surpass Wonder Woman at the worldwide box office. Thoughts? Absol you are absolutely 100% correct. It's not going to have the legs that Wonder Woman had. It doesn't have the audience reaction or the critic reaction that Wonder Woman had. It's coming out with an opening weekend lower than what Wonder Woman had. There's no chance, no chance Justice League catches Wonder Woman. Not a chance. All right, next one. Comes to us from 3D Dude Rules, who writes, uh, John, I saw it last night, and the theater here was full. The tickets were sold out, and not a single chair was empty. Yeah, look, when a movie makes almost $100 million, that means there are a lot of screenings that were sold out. You, you don't get to a $100 million opening weekend without having a good number of theaters sold out. Problem is, they didn't have enough of them. Nowhere near enough of them. But like I said, last night, my theater was sold out. My theater that cost $23.50 for a ticket was sold out last night. There are lots of theaters that were sold out. You, you can't make that much money and not have theaters that are sold out, but you need a lot more theaters that are sold out to get to the $150 million range, the, approach the $200 million range, and that, that unfortunately, you failed to do. Uh, let's see. This one says, uh, Jacob Pamaj writes, John, what is your opinion on Dub Warner Brother now messing with the director's vision uh, for their film a third time now? It's irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. Here's the only difference. All right? Every studio has input and interferes, interferes. When the movie works, it's called collaboration. When the movie turns out bad, they call it interference. That's the only difference. It's just terminology of it. Look, I've told the story before, but Joss Whedon, I sat down at a screening with Joss Whedon of Avengers once, and then he did a Q&A, and he talked about uh, how much influence Marvel and Kevin Feige had on the film. There were things Joss Whedon wanted to do that Marvel would not let him do. There was a couple things Joss Whedon didn't want to do that Marvel made him do. It was collaboration because the movie worked. In my opinion, the best comic book movie ever made. A lot of you have different opinions. That's cool. I'm just telling you that's mine. And it was mostly Joss Whedon's movie, but yes, Marvel interfered because it's their movie and it's collaboration. They don't want the whole movie just to be based on one person's vision. You know what you get when you get a filmmaker who's totally not interfered with and just gets to do whatever he wants to do? You get mother. That's what you get. You get mother. Uh, you get the prequels when nobody had the power to say no to George Lucas. You get the prequels. That's what you get. Peter Jackson talks about the Lord of the Rings trilogy about how much influence and how much how closely he worked with the studio. See, when the movie works, it's called working closely in collaboration. When the movie turns out bad, we call it interference and we want to point the finger at somebody. The reality is that studios, they're paying for the movie. It's their money. It is not the director's movie. It is the studio's movie. It is their money. They pay for it. They put everything up. And they're the ones who suffer the consequences for it if a movie makes money or loses money. Director doesn't lose any money if a movie loses money. Movie loses $200 million. No sweat off the director's brow. He got his paycheck. I mean, so, yeah, that's it's just the difference. We don't hear, when the movie is good, we don't hear about all that stuff. But it's there. And we just call it collaboration. When there's a failure and things lose, we call it interference because we're looking for scapegoat excuses for what happened. The reality is there's a lot of blame to go around. And, uh, and that's just the truth of it. All right. That will do it for me, guys, for this installment of the John Campia Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, guys, the point of this show is never to tell you what you should think or for you to tell me what I should think. The point of a show like this is for us as film fans in a safe place to come together, express our different views and opinions, and take others' views and opinions into consideration, not so we can agree or disagree, but so we can better understand our own positions. I've often said this, my job as a, as a film critic and as a film pundit is not to tell you what to think. My job is to tell you what I think and explain why I think it. And then you can take that information to help sharpen your ideas about why you disagree with me or why you agree with me. It's not being agreement. It's about having discussion and dialogue and having different points of view to expand our film fan experience. And that's what it's all about. So I want to thank you guys for being here today and being a part of that community and making being a film fan so much fun for me. Make sure you guys click the thumbs up button. That helps my videos a lot. Jump into the comment section, leave a thought, join the discussion. But remember guys, when you do that, 
Even when we have different opinions, we're all on the same team. We are all film fans together. Let's make being a film fan great again. Maybe I shouldn't wear it like that. Anyway, jump down in there and leave your thoughts. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on social media, simply on Facebook and on Twitter. You can see those right there, at John Campia. That'll do it for me, guys. Remember, I've got my own standalone video about the box office report and Justice League making under $96 million. That should be up in just an hour or two. Keep your eyes open for that. That'll do it for me, guys. Thank you much, so much for joining me. My name's John Campia, and until the next video, bye bye